The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. How many want to be dealt with this morning? Okay. Well, be f- wow. There's actually people who want to be dealt with. <laughs> I like that. But before we begin, uh, Sid, Sid Roth has a word. I want him to share that word. <laughs> uh, for a long time, I've recognized we've had a revelation of the name of Jesus, and you have too. For a long time, I've recognized, and you have too, we've had a revelation of the Holy Spirit. But I know that the last move of God's Spirit will be a revelation of God the Father. And even though we're at the infancy of that at this moment in this congregation, uh, I see a caveat, a warning. And here is the warning. Uh, But even before I get to that, uh, I personally, because my background is Jewish, I've observed inch by inch the church is getting away from the holiness of God the fear of God, the reverence of God. I mean, I I have to be candid with you and transparent. And just because something bothers me doesn't mean it should bother you. But I don't like, yea, God. I don't like applauding God. I applaud sports teams. because, and it's probably because of my background. I recognize that. Someone with a Catholic background or a Jewish background would really relate to what I'm saying right now. But you see, it's like there are two major sides of God. There is the holiness of God, the honor of God, the respect of God the Father, and then there is New Testament tells us God is love. So uh, most of us have had pretty imperfect parents. They've either been on one side of the coin or the other. They've either been legalists or they were uh, 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 just loving and not telling us right from wrong. And guess what? Both of them are out of balance. And we kind of transfer our relationship with our natural father to Father God. My natural father was very religious, uh, a real authoritative type. So that's the way I look, even though in my intellectually I knew the difference, I still looked at God the way my religion and the way my father looked at God. But here's the danger. We're coming, this congregation is a forerunner of what, it's not just this congregation. It's probably happening in a lot of congregations throughout the world right now, but it's a forerunner in understanding and bringing to the church uh, the understanding of God the Father. And there, there's, uh, let me, but the problem is one side or the other, one ditch or the other. That's what the devil wants. He always does this. He takes something good and he tries to distort it. You'll either, if you're not in balance, you will become a legalist. There won't be one ounce of love in you. Or if you're out of balance, you'll become a a cheap grace teacher, which says everything's fine, you don't need to repent. Both extremes are wrong. But there is a wonderful balance. Let me read you a promise from God's word. 
that I was thinking about as I was worshiping. It's uh, from the Ten Commandments. And this is what God says in Exodus 20, verse 12, the New Living Translation. Honor, and by the way, that's a missing word. That was the word I was looking for in the, uh, what bothered me on the extreme grace message. The honor isn't there anymore. He's my buddy. Yay, God. Now, I'm not putting anyone down that does this. I'm just trying to make a point. Uh, and it's in your own heart. If it makes you closer to God, I urge you to do that. But uh, the tendency, it's like the boiling, slow boil of a frog in a pot in water. It, it just gets stronger and stronger until the, the frog is boiled alive. Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and mother. Then, that's an important word, then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And uh, so it's both sides of God you need. But if you fall in a ditch on either side, you won't walk in the fullness. And as a matter of fact, if you fall in the ditch of legalism, you won't bring anyone with you. <laughs> and that's your assignment here on earth. What the Lord's laid on my heart today is we're going to move on to maturity. For decades, well, Sid said it, so I guess I can say it too. I've always been a forerunner. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, I paid a tremendous price for introducing some things in the church, including the prophetic, that was pretty much unheard of at that time, and I paid a tremendous price for it. But after it was established pretty much in the church at large, I mean, we had dance, four different dance teams, worship teams, mime, drama, everything in the arts was there. We had a Joseph and Daniel company for business people to realize that they're spiritual. <laughs> and all of that, and then suddenly, just as suddenly as God says, what you did was you fully equipped them, pulled out their gold for the building. Not that that's wrong, not that there aren't plenty of people doing it, but I have no interest in it whatsoever. I mean, my dancers had the full battle array, they had all the outfits and everything, every kind. I had a whole room full of mirrors where they practiced Hebrew worship dance, where they did spontaneous, they did four different teams. But all of a sudden God said, now, from this point on, I want you to plant a church in Charlotte. And it's not really a church, it's going to be, I want you to birth a church. No matter who comes, yeah, I understand the concept of church, but He says, I want you to birth something. I want you to birth them to prepare them for life where they spend 90% of the time. You did well equipping them for in a building where they spend 1% of their time. Equip them for the marketplace so that in every walk of life that they're walking in an overflow of abundance. And also bring them to the place of maturity, which is why we named it Full Stature. Our mission is to challenge the people that have been established and perhaps think they've arrived because they can compare themselves with those that, that uh, quite frankly, are still very immature. That doesn't make you mature by looking at those that are immature. All right? Some people would rather be an expert in kindergarten than learning something in the first grade. All right? And I hope we don't have any like that. You should all be hungering and thirsting for more. Well, the Lord's challenged me now that for decades we preached, for the most part, the church at large, and still are preaching it, and still do have materials there for, for people to learn, a forgiveness message. Did you know that in little children, young men, and fathers, as increments of maturity, that that's still the little child? Do you realize that? If you don't know how to forgive, and much of the church didn't know how to do it properly, because the Bible says in Matthew 18, from the heart. And everywhere we went, people were trying to forgive from the head and getting frustrated. Spending years trying to forgive somebody, months, weeks. That is absolutely ridiculous. Anyone who is bummed out for more than an hour is not really applying what God has given them. 
How many, do you know, yourself, been bummed out for days? I'm telling you what, that, that, sh that should be history. That should be part of your adolescent, childish training going away with. Well, I wanna, I wanna provoke you, to stimulate you to love and good deeds, but I wanna challenge you to a, a, to a closer spiritual walk with the Lord Jesus because he's making himself available. He's cleansing hearts. We've taught forgiveness, which I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven. And you're pretty much preoccupied with what he does for me and how he blesses me. And he does bless you because the love of the Father is in his love for children, but he doesn't want you to remain children. He wants you to move on. He wants you to be strong young men that can basically take over the family business. That's a lot different than a baby who's bummed out all the time crying and I need this, I need that, and I'm hurting and I'm stuck and I'm bummed out so I ain't going to church. That stuff should have ceased actually. I believe the message of the Hebrews is the message of the church right now. Yeah. Thus saith the Lord. Yeah. For by reason of time you should have been teachers. You still need milk. But strong meat belongs to them who are full age, who by reason of use, who by reason of use, not by reason of your giftings, by reason of use, have your senses exercised to discern that which is good and that which is evil. God wants us to basically exercise that spirit. And I'm convinced that <clears throat> if you want to know about forgiveness, we've got six books back there. We've got tons of material that walks you through. Do you know even uh, what Sid just shared, honor? Did you know what the first step or the baby step of the school of the Spirit is? You close your eyes, drop down and connect to your spirit, and say, God, I'm here to honor you. I don't want to grieve, quench, or resist you in any way. That's when I was six months old in the Lord. Practice that before you practice some of the other stuff, right? Have a proper heart attitude. I don't want to grieve, quench, or resist you. That's a relationship. When you have that attitude and cultivate that attitude, I'll tell you what, there's nothing going to stop you from doing all that he called you to do and being all that he called you to be. And being trumps doing. God wants you to grow up. Now, how many know that we've taught you again and again? Probably nobody in this room and nobody that watches us regularly on Ustream doesn't know how to forgive. But there still doesn't mean that the rest of the church doesn't need some instruction, right? You forgive because the forgiver lives in you. And he, you forgive from the heart, and it changes to peace, and it's instant. It's not a long work of restoration. Reconciliation can take time, but forgiveness is instant, just like it's salvation. It wasn't a hard thing. Jesus, come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin, and I'll live for you and serve you all the days of my life. And then you said thank you. Why did you say thank you? Because in your knower, you knew that you had received. And you have him. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to speak to the mature. If you're not there yet, save this message for a later date, all right? But I want to speak to the people that I know, not only do they know how to forgive, but they walk in a forgiveness lifestyle, which is the love message where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? Because you can love your car, you can love your cat, you can love all kinds of things. But when you forgive, you are demonstrating kingdom love. When you forgive, bless them that curse you, pray for them. Now you're saying something. Now you're actually r revealing that it's the Jesus in you that you're obedient to and that you're submissive to, that you're honoring. And you're honoring that person who lives in you, fused together with you as a, as a join to the Lord. You're one spirit with him. It's a, it's a we that on the inside that's going to be a continual walk in the spirit. Now, I want to move it on. Now, let's suppose, let's suppose you've been through our courses and everything and that it's changed your life and you are walking in the presence of God in a forgiveness lifestyle. You don't get stuck for hours on end, but you resolve things within minutes. I don't wanna see you no hands. We're gonna suppose that within minutes you learn to resolve things, to let nothing come between what you and God have together. That's the way he spoke it to me as a baby Christian. Dennis, when you feel anything toxic, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, I don't care what it is, it's coming between what you and I have together. Do you want to honor me or not? That's how I learned to forgive. 
I don't want anything coming between me and him. Because it grieves, quenches, or resists him. And he's a person. And you don't treat people like that. Much less God. Right? Well, here I want to take you. Let's move on to maturity, as it says in Hebrews. Let's not lay again the foundation. I want to talk to people who have gotten so proficient in living a forgiveness lifestyle. I want to train you in your spirit in the how-tos to deal with temptation. Wouldn't you rather just be proficient at dealing with temptation and a walk in the spirit to where you're not stuck? On, I've seen people who are proficient in forgiveness, but they still always look like a victim to me. They never learned how to militantly be a lover. They're only busy forgiving because it hurt. Forgiving, removing the hurt. That's a benefit of forgiveness to re remove the hurt. That's a good thing. But it also removes where you've been stunted emotionally. Every time you forgive, you remove the barrier. Have you ever seen uh, uh, an adult acting like a three-year-old? Yeah. Because they've stunted their growth emotionally. It doesn't matter whether they grew intellectually. They, they're stunted emotionally. They're still a child. That childishness needs to go. We need to put away childish things. I want you to move from the child to the young man, but I want a company of fathers. I want a company of fathers that can handle a harvest. And in order to do that, you've got to have the father's heart. And what would the father's heart be for his children? To teach them how to forgive, to teach them how to forgive, but then know that they've never really grown up beyond that. It's cute when you see a little baby spit up a little bit of milk and you go, ah, look how cute. If a teenager did that, you'd say there's something wrong with that child, <laughs> right? I think that's the way God's looking at the church. He says, you know, it was cute when you were a baby Christian to get away with that stuff, but now let's grow up. So I want to show you how to deal with temptation, assuming you walk in a forgiveness lifestyle is as easy as breathing, and it should be. You want to move from the child to a young man who's strong in the Lord, Literally, it's, it's Jesus in a replaced life to where it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. You become so God inside minded that it is a constant awareness. What's even transpired to me lately is for 40, I'd say 40 years as a believer, I could maintain the presence of God here in my gut as, and use my mind at the same time. It's like dual awareness. Pay attention to what's going on in my spirit at all times. Paying attention for anything that comes in and robs me of my peace. It needs to go. If you give in to the sin, you receive forgiveness for it till you get your peace back. And it's like a dual awareness. Well, within the last six weeks, it's even intensified. This is after 40 years. It's intensified to where now it's not only dual awareness. It's like Jesus is on the inside looking out my eyes. And I want to tell you now, when you blow it or you get a bad feeling, my sensitivity has increased. I want your sensitivity to increase, don't you? Don't you want your conscience clean? You know, part of an awakening is to come out of a slumber. I think there's some things that, that you do in your sleep that you would never do if you were awake, right? If you ever dream some dreams, you go, thank God I wasn't awake doing that, right? I believe the body needs to have that veil, and that veil is thinning to where God's going to begin to allow you to see what's in your heart. And so I want to teach you how to walk with temptation because at any level, child, young man, or a father, you're going to deal with temptation because it's there. All right? So I'm going to give you a few how-tos for when you're proficient and forgiveness is no longer an issue. Repentance is no longer an issue. You know how to do that. You know that it's a gift from God. You know that it's the Jesus in you that's doing the work. Proverbs 16.32, he who rules his spirit is better than he who taketh a city. What God's basically saying, I'm looking for people who are so under the lordship of Jesus, I don't care about your successes. I don't care about your conquering. Unsaved people can be successful. Unsaved people can get results. God is saying, I'm looking for someone who's under my lordship. Because Anyone who doesn't have that rule over his spirit, it's like a city broken down without walls. Now, in Bible times particularly, a city without walls was vulnerable to the enemy. They could come in and run roughshod. There was no protection. And God's basically saying, a person whose walls broken down, you, the enemy, it's like walking around with signs, kick me all over you. And then you'll call it spiritual warfare when in reality, 
You haven't even learned how to resist. You haven't learned how to keep your heart. You haven't learned how to let the Spirit rule your heart. Now, temptation. We live in a world filled with temptation, and it is a, say this back to me, it's a constant element in which we live. <laughs> temptation is a constant element in which we live. And if you don't see that, you are already caught up really bad. It's a constant element in which we live. Now, it is both a blessing and a battlefield. And I promise I won't get too excited about this. It's a blessing and a battlefield. In other words, as a battlefield, it's tailor-made for you to show you what you need to overcome and be of good cheer. He has overcome the world, and where is he? Point to him. I don't have nobody pointing to heaven in this church. <laughs> yes, he's in heaven. But in this world, you'll have tribulation. You're going to have challenges. I want a people who can face any challenge and say, Oh, that's a challenge, but it's an opportunity. Yes, it's a battlefield. But on the other side is the blessing to where greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world is going to manifest, and I'm going to get on the other side of it, and I'm going to be stronger. And actually, how many faith people do we have in here that were trained in faith camp? Well, a lot of faith camp training? Good. Because what did they basically say in, in the faith camp? Huh? That... Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Overcome with your faith. Right? Faith is now. All right. Well, that faith is basically your ability to have the experience of the no-so right now. And it's both a blessing and it's a battlefield. In other words, be of good cheer, I've overcome. How many can get excited when there's a challenge? Yeah, it gets real quiet. I want to help you get excited when there's a challenge. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials, challenges. Why? That the testing of your faith produces something. Do you want to stay a baby forever and try to avoid, go under, around, ignore, deny every challenge that comes in your life or are you going to face it head on and overcome? God wants you to overcome. He wants you to see that there's a, there's a battle, there's a victory on the other side. Almost to the point where you can consider it pure joy. I say almost because you're not there yet. <laughs> Why is it in the scripture? Should we just avoid that because it's not comfortable? I'm saying that we need to elevate the scriptures to a higher revelation. As we draw closer to God, we should see it from a higher criteria. Not legalistic, not to give up hopeless. I know Christians. There's people who don't go to church anymore because they couldn't walk in the basics. And then they just blame the church and God and the Bible. No, you couldn't walk in the basics. If you don't master the basics, you're not ready for the next level. The basics are never going to leave you. But the replaced life gives us a power over temptation. When you actually get to the place to where you become so God inside minded that it's a we consciousness, even if you don't say that word, it's I've been joined to the Lord and I'm one spirit with him. I'm aware of him being in there. Anything that happens to me happens to us. Consciousness. Until that's a consciousness, you're not there yet. But if you're there, and that consciousness is there as normative, not something you have to struggle with to get there. When that consciousness is normative, that it's a, I'm joined together with the Lord, I'm one spirit with him, that's the real me, the new creation me, right? Now I'm living by Christ's spirit within me instead of self-effort. Say that back to me. I am now living with Christ's Spirit in me versus self-effort. How many of you have friends that dropped out of church because they tried and they got burned out? That's the baby stage where you haven't learned to walk in the Spirit yet. You haven't learned to take the training wheels off yet. They might be biblically literate, 
and be great theologians, but I'm watching the people that, it seems like the people I get upset, that get upset with me are mostly religious people who are well versed, who have minimal experience. It's intimidating if you have minimal experience, but you got a lot of head knowledge. It'll, it'll, start, it'll start to work on them. I say, find out why you don't know what I'm talking about. Right? If somebody's experience is beyond yours, then hunger and thirst for more of God for yourself. I think it's coming at a time when we want to see the maturity of the church get ready. We're going to have to conquer moment by moment living, not inside of a church meeting or in a house group. We need to conquer it on the job when there's no other Christian but you. That's where the rubber meets the road. And here's what I'm saying. The temptation has to separate self-effort from Christ in me. If you are still talking bad about yourself, you're still in the child stage. By reason of time, you ought to be teachers. Experientially, I don't care how much Bible you know. I'm not impressed with that. I'm impressed with your walk with God and how close He is to you and how real He is to you and how tender your heart is toward Him. To what degree? I think Sid had the great word, honor. Honor has with it its reward. The lack of honor also has the reward that are missing, that could have been yours. God's basically taken us to the place where temptation, look at Jesus. Jesus can sympathize with our weakness because He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now let's look at that Jesus. Didn't He, he was God, but He was man. And when He walked, He wanted nothing. He was tempted in every way. That means there was stuff pulling on his appetites and his desires that he had as a self was being pulled out of him. Each one is drawn away. But his union, he, I don't think he struggled with forgiveness. I don't think he struggled with having bad days. And I don't believe he talked bad about himself. Do you? If he's going to be our example, then let's knock the baby stuff off <laughs> and say Jesus didn't talk bad about himself. And if you still talk bad about yourself, grow up and Put away childish things. Say, stop it, because you're still looking at it from an unsaved perspective. You're looking at it from a sin consciousness rather than a son or a daughter consciousness. If you hear something in your head and it doesn't sound like God, it's not God. <laughs> I don't care if it's flesh or demonic. If it doesn't sound like something that's scriptural, it's not Him. Right? So if He was tempted in all ways yet without us, that means that He... He could feel his five senses, appetites, desires, being drawn away. But what did he do? He did not want to operate apart from his Father. Isn't that what sin does? It wants to draw, look at me, draw you out from here. Here's where you're in union and communion. He wants to draw you, the new creation you, out to draw you out. He wants you to believe and convince you that out there is something that you have to have. And to get it, you have to go apart from Him. Jesus said He was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. That means He was tempted and never gave in. Do you know how to be tempted and not give in? Don't answer that. Because here's what needs to be understood. For those walking in that newness of life, and you feel the cleansing power of God, you feel the holiness of God on the inside, it doesn't mean you can never sin. What it does mean is that just as Jesus met Satan in the wilderness, isn't that interesting that the Holy Spirit took Jesus to the wilderness? He said there's going to be a battle here but there's a blessing here. And he attacked him spirit, soul, and body. 
He attacked his body by saying, if thou art a son, why don't you make yourself some bread? You haven't eaten. And said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'll tell you what, there's a revelation of the Father coming where people are going to be so into the will of God as their food that there's going to be a different kind of fasting. They're going to find an internal spiritual satisfaction doing the will of God from the heart. And they're going to say, I have food that you know not of. My food's to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. There is an internal satisfaction. That's better than fasting. Fasting is like a little, a little tip of the iceberg of what it could be like as far as drawing closer to God and getting into the river of the pleasure of His will. And His will is His pleasure. If you're going to lean toward legalism, you'll just see it as drudging duty and what I got to quit and what I got to give up and make rules and regulations. When in reality, if you had a relationship with Him and the living Word is living, He's not going to violate His Word. You need to just concentrate on your walk with Him. He won't, he won't contradict the Word of God. He's the living Word filling you from head to toe. Now, he was in the wilderness and he was tested in his soul. All the great achievements of man, art, science, literature, inventions, they flow, they flow from the soul. And it's either going to be run by Satan or it's going to be run by God. Soul is greater than the body, just like the spirit is greater than the soul. But basically... For Jesus, history was in the balance, wasn't it? He was being tempted in his body for bread. He was being tempted in his soul. And he basically said, I'm not going to interfere with the destiny of mankind by submitting to any of those temptations. He basically defeated the enemy in soul. He defeated him in spirit. What did Satan want him to do in the spirit? Do a miracle. Do a miracle. Show if you're the Son of God. Let's seize this sign. Put him to a foolish test. I'm telling you, this is what you're going to be looking for. You want to move on from childhood to, to even a young man or a young woman in God. You want to move to that next step in maturity. Not Bible knowledge, maturity. Then basically, one of the key indications, these will be the things that are absent from your life. The five, six deadly sea. Six is the number of flesh. The six deadly seas. You won't covet. Thou shalt not covet. You know what that means? You say, well, I, I, I never committed adultery. Did you ever want to? All right, I want to get you sensitive in your spirit. We're going to elevate the, <laughs> right? What is the purpose of elevating what God wants from you? You will either go legalism or you will recognize how desperately you need Him that apart from Him you can do nothing. No longer covet. Compare. Compete. Conceal. Hide it. Nonverbal people are good at hiding and concealing. Verbal people pretty much tell you what they think. <laughs> right? Complain. Did that cause the children of Israel a problem in the wilderness? Complaining? Uh-huh. control then you're right back you're right back to striving as opposed to letting God work and live his life through you and letting him flow through you for it is God who is at work to will and to do does this sound too hard I hope it sounds too hard because you can be on either side of the fence that's too hard yes because you, apart from him you can do nothing you need to go into a more deep surrender and dependence on him or you can live in la-la land and say, I'm doing better than most. That, uh, that don't bother me. I'm okay. I'm a good Christian. I'm basically a good person. I've even heard them say, I'm basically a good person. Which side of that is? I don't know. But I know one thing, that when those six C's are missing from your life, you're walking with integrity and a level of holiness that is going to precede the move of God on planet Earth. That's how you know your heart's clean. Those Six C's, six, the number of flesh, are missing. How many wrote those down? Compete, covet, comparing themselves amongst themselves, they proved to be unwise. 
If it's unwise and it's not the wisdom from above, what kind of wisdom is it? Sensual, earthly, demonic. Oh. Complain. When you complain, who are you really? You can complain about people, but what are you really doing? You're dissing God. You're dishonoring Him. Conceal. What are you doing when you conceal? You're putting on your religious face. You want to look good in front of people, but in your, in your heart full of dead men's bones or something, or wickedness. You, you're hiding something you don't want to see. And control. Either he's Lord or you're Lord. Who, who's, who's, who's who? You know, you've got two fathers. It's either going to be the father of the devil or God the Father. And I believe that what God's doing right now, He's saying, I'm going to clean up my church, but as I clean them up, I'm going to have to teach them. And this is the love and the mercy of God. I'm going to teach them how to deal with temptation so that they can get a taste of what it's like to walk in victory. Huh? You've heard about abundant life, but I've, I've seen people that, that could preach abundant life and didn't have any abundant life. I've ministered to pastors that didn't have abundant life, that preached abundant life. I want the real thing. And if it's not working in you, you can't give something you don't have. I want you all to have something worth giving other people because I really believe that what God is going to be doing in the days ahead is He's going to take people, cleanse you from those six deadly seas of competing, coveting, comparing, complaining, concealing, and controlling. Because here's the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. This is what's going to change. There's going to be a heart attitude that even if you don't verbalize it, it's going to be in your heart. To start recognizing where in Luke 19, where this is the parable where he gave, he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 minas. You know the story. And he said to them, do business till I come. Do business till I come. Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have that man rule over us. That's an attitude. That's not just a one-time thing. That's a disposition of the heart. Whenever you do things in your own strength, whenever you do things your way and you are not surrendered to God, you are in essence, in attitude, your disposition is, I will not have that man Jesus ruling over me. Do you think that would offend that should offend. People have been caught up with, confused as to what is God's part and what is your part. Your part is to be surrendered in your will and God will work through. Then as you move, you're moving from the place of peace and the place of lordship. If you don't have peace, you don't have lordship. And if temptation pulls you out, what does the devil want? What does he want from a believer? To get you to operate independently of the God inside you. That's where Jesus was successful for us, was he not? He beat him at his own game. He was tempted in those three areas and he overcame in those three areas. And what happened? He was in the wilderness, tested of the, of the enemy, and came out. I always like that part where he came out of the spirit. This reminds me of that verse in Song of Solomon. Who is this that comes out of the wilderness like smoke with all the fragrance? Do you imagine the fragrance of victory that was upon him? Do you imagine what a sweet smell, aroma of the anointing was on him when he came out of the wilderness? It says, when the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he's anointed me to preach the gospel, to heal the broken heart, set the captives free me that's a sweet smell of savoring anointing that was the sweet smell of all the fragrance of the merchants of the song of Solomon who is this that comes out of the wilderness like smoke you see I want you to see the, the challenges in your life for you to come out of that wilderness smelling sweet as smoke a sweet fragrance unto God and quit looking at as a poor me that poor me has to die me has to die and you need to replace life to where it is no longer I that live but Christ that lives within me and everything that happens is happening to us and everything that's happening is a battlefield and a blessing because I'm going to come out smelling like good smoke the fragrance of the Lord 
I'm going to start smelling like anointing oil. I'm going to start smelling like all the sweet, sweet fragrances that went into the anointing oil. Who is this that comes out of the wilderness like smoke? You're going to say, that's me. Why? Because you're more than a conqueror. Because Jesus in you is the one that conquered you. He's the one that did it. You just are along for it, cooperating, saying, yes, we did. Thank God in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome. Now, temptation. We need to understand. For I say to you that to everyone who has more will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. I think he's into free enterprise myself. Huh? To him, go and do business. Use what you have. Don't use what you have, even what you have will be taken away. But bring those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them. Bring me those enemies of mine who didn't want me to reign over them. We will not have that man Jesus reigning over us. Boy, we should get so convicted if that ever is in our heart to where we want to do it our way or go contrary to what God wants. I believe he's coming to clean the church up and the test will be the five, the six C's. When those are gone, you move to another level in God in your relationship. If those levels are still there, you still need cleaned up, you need forgiveness. But I want to teach you how to walk after the six C's are cleaned up and they're not much of an issue in your life anymore. Then you can handle the temptation. You're going to start seeing that re redemption has released us from the former taskmaster and now I'm joined to my Lord in a new and a fresh way. Don't you want that joining to be new and a fresh way? Well, let's the old man has become the new man. There's a new envelopment within, a new awareness. And for those that are experiencing this, there is an inner subconscious presence. There is a flowing of an underground stream that out of my belly is flowing constantly, a river providing that I am open to God. Out of my belly flows a river. I believe that what God has shown us, and we've got this in our next book, what he showed me as a baby Christian, he showed me the waters flowing out of the temple. And he gave me a, a basically, a, by revelation, he gave me a picture of, of how to equip the church, and, but first how to start with this temple. Before you deal with other people's temple, deal with this temple. And he showed me, he showed me a dome. And he says, that is the proper atmosphere. It's love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And without that atmosphere, the vision is, is dead. All the vision that God has is love. If it isn't a love vision, it's not His. Because God is love. He showed me that the atmosphere needs to be love, acceptance, and forgiveness with shouts of grace, grace to it. Those four elements in the atmosphere. Grace. What is grace? The personal presence of Jesus enabling you to be all that He called you to be and to enabling you to do all that He called you to do. There's no doing on your part. It's the doing on His part. Your part is surrender and let the river flow. Does that make sense? Then He showed me, Dennis, here's where you're going to start. On the foundation. No other foundation other than Other than intimacy with God. I could preach like this. It's okay with me. I feel like I'm in a movie theater. But basically what God was saying is that that intimacy, there's no other foundation. The lowest foundation on this building. The dome is the atmosphere, but the foundation is the Lord Himself. And you cannot build on any other foundation other than the Lordship of Jesus. The next foundation. He said, as you build on your relationship with me, the next foundation, I'm going to train you in the ways of God. Not just the acts of God, but in the ways that I operate. And I'm going to take you through the Beatitudes and show you how intimately you can walk in that relationship in the Beatitudes. How the wisdom in Proverbs is to show you how to live it out. I'm going to teach you the ways of God. And as you begin to see how I flow, and the way that I move, I'm going to make sure too that you have the next foundation. And that's Hebrews 6. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, 
baptisms, resurrection from the dead. I'm going to teach you the fundamental doctrines of Christ and you're going to equip the people to know those fundamental doctrines. Then he says the next level of the foundation is built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. I'm going to teach you the value of the body at large. I'm going to teach you the purpose of the foundation of the apostles and prophets and why they're building stones. And you know, notice, where was the apostles, prophets, and fivefold ministry? On the bottom. Because they will be servant leaders, not someone that has to be seen and heard, not someone who's promoting their own ministry, but leadership is on the foundation. And he says, and then this, this dome of atmosphere is going to be supported by three pillars. The first pillar is going to be what you would commonly call worship in the Word, but I'm calling it reality. I want the reality of His presence as priority one. Not about Him, Him. And that reality is going to take you to the second pillar that's going to hold up this structure, this infrastructure of a holy temple. And that second structure is from that place of reality, there's going to be transformation. That, that means no revelation that you get is exciting in and of itself unless it turns you to transformation. A lot of people have revelation for information. But revelation, if it doesn't change or transform, I wasn't interested in it. Because the mission was, it should change. If I die and go to heaven, by golly, if I come back the same, you're allowed to slap me around. Because that revelation should have brought tr radical transformation to me. If I'm no different, I really question the revelation. Then from that revelation of transformation, God says, I'm going to take you to the third pillar that holds up that atmosphere of love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace. And he says, and that, and that one is, is application. We call it the how-to's. But he says, I'm going to give you application at the level... At whatever level you go with me, Dennis, <laughs> I'm going to give you how-tos at that level. I'm going to give you application. And from that application, from those, I don't know if you can even picture what this looks like, from that dome, from the three pillars, from those four foundations, from the base of that temple is going to flow rivers of living water. And wherever those living waters flow, and you can't give something you don't have. I don't want theory. I want experience. I want demonstration. I want application. And God says basically that'll flow wherever the rivers flow. That's, it'll bring life. And I'm believing that, that basically the bottom line maturity structure is the child, the young man, and the fathers. And we're moving toward the fathers. But I've got to move beyond forgiveness. By golly, if you can't get that right, you better just stay there until you do get it right. But I want to move on. I want to bring the people into the level of the young man walking in victory where the Word of God abides in you strong. When I say the Word of God abides in you strong, I don't mean you know your Bible. I'm talking about the living Word from head to toe is living through your life where it's no longer I that live but Christ that lives in me. That's a young man. There was a time when I would have seen that as the Father. Now I'm saying, no, 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 no. As revelation increases, we've got a ways to go yet. The church is still in its infancy. They used to sing songs like, Mighty Warrior, Dressed for Battle. And I used to see people in pampers <laughs> holding a broomstick. And I'm going, hey, they're not there yet. They're singing all the right words. But those same people singing those songs are the same ones that are calling me, okay, Pastor, I can't forgive somebody for the last nine years, and I'm going to try now. Right. Mighty warrior <laughs> dressed for battle. It's kind of hard to get the picture different, isn't it? Right before you go up to preach, right before you walk up, Pastor Dennis, I just want to tell you I'm going to divorce my husband in the next three hours. I'll, would you pray for me right now? <laughs> Do you think we have to grow beyond that kind of stuff? Okay, then God loves a church. And he loves little children, but he doesn't want to see little children by the time they're a teenager, and by reason of you should be teachers, still dribbling with that stuff. It's cute in the beginning. I, I get a chuckle out of baby Christian's behavior. I love them. But if they've been around for 30 years and they're still acting like that, they need discipline. They need this message. It doesn't make them think. Temptation. Temptation is not sin. Say that back to me. Temptation is not sin. Because here's what happens. Temptation tries to move us away from Christ and get us... Doesn't it say that sin draws you away? 
Every man is drawn away and enticed. Right, James? That means, here's my relationship, me and Jesus, in here. There's temptation out there and it's trying to draw me away so that I will act independent of God and do whatever. That's the way it works. But when you refuse and you see it drawing you and you drop down and connect in your spirit and say, we are not going there. Then you're depending on Him, not self-effort. You're depending on the God in you and His strength. There's a, I remember one of the mystics used to talk about the law of, who was it? The law of central tendency, Madame Goyon. She used to talk about, and I always saw, when she talked about the law of central tendency, I always saw it as God's keeping power and His ability to draw you. So you can be drawn away by lust with your five senses, but if you will return to Him, Oh, he comes running to you like the father after the prodigal. The prodigal just shuffling on home like this. A father comes running. It's the same way on the inside. If you don't give in to that temptation, you know you're being pulled away. You draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. And when he comes, he has keeping power. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I want to see believers that are overcoming temptation on a regular basis. And if you do sin, for goodness sake, at least you know how to forgive. But the blessing is don't stay there. You can be a great forgiver and be a victim all the time. Because what about those people that face the same person they got to forgive every day? <laughs> huh? You better get the victory over having to forgive them every day and getting the victory to where all of a sudden you are tempted and no longer give in. You don't take it in. It's not about you and your hurts and your owies. And we got tons of stuff on hurts and owies. <laughs> I want to get you past the hurts and the owies to where you're a militant forgiver, lover of God, to where you're others or to where you get to the point where you go, death worketh in me, but life in you. Oh, now we're messing. Yeah, that's the father. Mm, death worketh in me because I am others oriented. We are a kingdom of kings and priests. I don't think so. We're not there yet. Kings and priests, a king is that we will reign in this life as kings. Romans 5, 17, and the Amplified says reign as kings in this life. To reign as a king does not mean you're an independent self. If you're still an independent self functioning apart from God, you're no king. That's king self. He needs dethroned. To reign as a king, you've got the king on the inside of you, and the king is not like in the world where the Gentiles have kings and they do what? They rule over, right? They dominate. Jesus says, not so with me. I am among you as he who serves. To understand kings and priests, priests are totally sold out to other people. Who in here is totally sold out to other people? Who's not preoccupied with your own situation? You think we have a ways to go? There's people going to get there. And when they get there, they're going to challenge you with the status quo. Why are you where you're at? Why are you still in kindergarten as an expert? There's some first graders out there that have tapped in and experienced more of God. Doesn't that create a desire in you and a hunger for more? Because with that hunger comes desperation. With that desperation comes an awakening. And you come out of the sleep and the slumber and the lethargy. That's got to be broken. Now, temptation is not sin, but to act on a temptation is sin. Temptation always touches the vulnerable point in you. Temptation, say that back to me. Temptation always touches the vulnerable place in me. So it's tailor-made for you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Stop and go backwards now. Um, anything you've been complaining about that you've given into with sinful complaining, and if something gets in your goat, maybe you've got the goat. <laughs> maybe it's your goat. Maybe it's not that other person that needs to change. Maybe you need to learn how to respond. I've seen thinkers. How many in here do we have that are thinkers? Real strong head people. I'm going to save you some aggravation. This is a lesson the Lord taught me. 
Seek, I thought it was John F. Kennedy when he spoke it to me. Remember how John F. Kennedy said, seek not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I heard that voice and it sounded like he had a Boston accent, I swear. But it was in my head. And he said, Dennis, because I was over explaining myself. Have you ever over explained yourself? Or backed off and said, nobody understands me. No. Well, all right. Well, either way, it's both wrong. God says, Dennis, seek not to be understood, but rather to understand people. And that helped me in ministry. Because the effort is getting in someone else's shoes, you know where they're coming from, whether they're a baby Christian or a mature Christian. Whether they're hurting in this area or they're hurting in that area, you basically know where they're coming from. It was the way Jesus ministered. That way you only do what the heart of the Father is telling you to do. You only say what you hear Him say, but you don't have canned answers that fit everybody. You treat everyone based on where they're at. And trust me, they're all over the place. <laughs> All right? Now, temptation will touch a vulnerable spot, and that's the chief use and the chief danger of temptation is it hits you where you're vulnerable. Now, <clears throat> body, soul, and spirit has to go through the crucible of temptation and come out so we're going to win the battle. What does winning the battle look like? You come out with a heart that's fixed. Me and God are fixed. What we're looking for is a fixed disposition. If you're being tempted in an area, it's saying you're being picked on in that particular area because that's an area that you're weak. Until you can admit that apart from Him I can do nothing and surrender to God in that area to let Him be victorious over there. But if you're still trying harder, pride always tries harder. I used to watch all the years of pastoral counseling. Pride will even ask for help, but never really fully surrender. Pride doesn't see itself, but pride will always bring the fall. Pride tries harder. We, I had two sermons. One was fail, but don't be a failure. All right? For Christians. Then the other sermon was, all right, you're a failure. Apart from him, you can do nothing. At some point in your life, you need one of those two. Quit bad-mouthing yourself and calling yourself names. But then if you keep trying harder and it's not working, then yes, you are a failure. Apart from him, you could do nothing. Admit it, quit it, and quit trying to hang on and justify yourself. I can remember when the Lord nailed me on that pride. He basically said, oh, you think that standard is good for them, but you have a different standard for you. I go, oh, there's only one standard, the cross. It goes across the board for everybody, no matter where they're at. Now, temptation, we are only temptable at the points that we're sensitive to that particular type of appeal. In a sense, we draw our particular temptations to ourselves because they expose our weak points. I ever told you about the, the man that was struggling in sexual issues from a town 20 miles from where I lived? I tried to minister to him. He didn't want to hear it. He didn't have a problem. Three pastors recommended him to me. A woman who basically had, was married and had sexual issues and didn't want to get free. And I don't want to go into why. <laughs> she didn't want to get free. I went to a Christian function. It was a dinner, 400 people in attendance. And these two strangers walked in the door and went like this. Shoo! So don't tell me you don't draw that to yourself. You can complain about the things that happen in your life. But you know, if you've got bitter roots and undealt with demonic stuff in you, it attracts like kind. Did you ever wonder why some woman says, I've been married four times and each time they were an alcoholic. You know, at the time they didn't even know they were doing it. It draws you together. So look at the temptations that are coming in your life. There's something at the root of that temptation that you love and you will not have that man Jesus reigning over you. Ouch. Right? 
There's something in you that says, I will not have that man Jesus ruling over that. I love that more than I love Jesus. And until you get to that level of honesty, you probably won't deal with it. We're only temptable at the point where we are sensitive to that particular type of appeal. Temptations force us to make a choice. <clears throat> That's interesting. Mature believers, temptation forces you to make a choice. How have you been choosing? We sin or we stand in the victory that's already been won by the Jesus in us. If we will surrender into him and refuse to act outside of him. There's no such thing as operating independently. You are either under the prince of the power of the air or you are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, We win by yielding to the Christ within. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law because I am crucified with Christ. Your victories actually make you stronger. If it's tough, good. Say that back to me. If it's tough, good. Now, I'm probably not speaking to babies right now, right? Because they don't like that statement. If it's tough, it's good. But if it's faith to faith, grace to grace, glory to glory, there has to be resistance for you to overcome. What do problems, pressures, and temptations do to us? Well, they involve us in situations. They stir us up. They present opportunities for God to work. They let us know we need God. It stirs up humanity exactly where God can express himself as God. Will you let God express himself through your life or are you going to succumb to the temptation? Now, the secret, this is for those who are comfortable with this teaching, who are walking in such victory already with a forgiveness message, they are now moving to where they are sinning far and few between, although they do, and entering into a victory by not giving in to temptation, they're basically saying, I've learned that in all those situations, I yield to Christ within. Faced with it, it's pulling at me, and I yield to Christ within. Not try harder. The minute you try, he's got you. What happens when you try? I'm going to try to resist. You're out there, and he's he got you. I got him now. I got him because he's not depending on Jesus. He's going to try harder. Pride always tries harder. Are we going to graduate beyond trying? What's the, what, what way could we honor God? Trust? How do I trust him? I'm going to have to yield to him and surrender to him. <coughs> that word surrender is going to come back to the body of Christ in the days ahead. Instead of being just a doer of the word, you're going to be a doer of the word because you surrendered to the word. The secret is never trying. The secret is always replacement. What I am not, God is. Let him do the work. It makes us dependent, confident in God, and strong in the spirit. Now, temptation is not sin. So giving in to temptation and reacting is sin. Our dislike for a person is not replaced by God's love or it needs to be replaced by God's love. Instead of yielding to faith, I give in to fear. I give in to feeling of impatience with an angry thought or word. That's pretty standard. Everybody understood that, right? But here's what the scripture says. Through faith and patience you receive the promise. So what that means is in the midst of a hostile scenario, you yield to God in faith, and you hold your heart open to God, even when it's like, what are these people doing? I have no idea what they're trying to get across. They're, they're saying something mean to me right now. Oh my goodness. But from that place of peace, I am doing two things. One, peace is guarding my heart and my mind from being affected adversely. Peace is allowing me to yield to Him for the wisdom that comes from above. I found out in every hostile crisis environment and when you yield to God the wisdom that from that comes from above in you is first what pure if your heart's not pure you don't get wisdom 
You'd be unnecessarily harsh and call it wisdom. But you, wisdom that comes from above when you yield is first pure, peaceable. Here's something I never saw until recently. Easily yields. The wisdom that comes from above easily yields in a scenario for the wisdom of God to give you application. Because everything's not the same. There's no cookie cutter. So I'm saying the wisdom that comes from above, you have to learn how to yield to it. He has been made unto us wisdom on the inside. If any of you lack, ask. But if you don't surrender to Him, you're not asking Him. You're trying to figure it out with your head. Head people, CSCL students, thrilled my heart. Third grader. Everybody knows there's no living water in your head. Third grade. Is that profound? <laughs> then we should be operating from our spirit, right? Connected with the new creation in us. There's no living water in your head. Thinkers get into the trouble of trying to figure out why. If you're a thinker, you've gotten yourself in more trouble figuring out why. That's the wrong question. Why did this happen? Or is that God, is that the devil let, ha, let that happen? Or is that God let that happen? Still the wrong question. You know what you should be doing as a believer? With a more implicit trust in God, you should be saying, how do you want me to respond, God? Instead of getting all hung up on the source. Is that God or is that the devil? Now there's times you need to discern the source. But primarily, your primary responsibility is how do I respond to God? How do I respond in light of that situation? How about that person that's just having a meltdown? How do I respond, God? You want to be redemptive? You want to be beneficial to someone that's having a meltdown? Then you have to be leaning upon, yielded to the Christ in you. Or you're not much value to anybody. You go, I don't know, better call the pastor on that one. Let's source that one out. Let's give some referrals. But God's basically saying, we give in to our flesh, the other result could happen. Like uh, Sid shared, the two sides, the two extremes. Here's the other extreme. One, <clears throat> you go into condemnation when you get tempted. Temptation is not sin. I've watched religious people beat themselves for being tempted. In this world, it's going to be a constant draw to tempt you. You don't beat yourself for temptation. You don't even beat yourself when you sin. What you do is you receive forgiveness. Con there is therefore now no condemnation. You've got to get more into the Romans 8 of the lifestyle. So, on the one hand, I want to teach people to get beyond forgive, 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 repent, repent, repent. I mean, I've seen people in the church come forward to get saved week after week even. That's the extreme of that. You've got to learn how to walk in the Spirit and stay clean. And when you mess up, get clean. But also learn to challenge yourself to walk in the level of understanding temptation and get victorious over the temptation so you get stronger in the divine nature. Now, <clears throat> who do we think we are anyway? Only God is good. How many people argue with them? I can't believe I did that. Have you ever said that? That's false self-esteem. That's coming from the world. That's not God. You don't need self-esteem. Do you know that God had the healthy self-love? You know what healthy self-love is? This is where we should be as believers. So confident in the Eucharist. God says, I am. Uh-oh. Is he an egotist? I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am the light of heaven. I am. Whoa. God stuck on the I? Is he an egotist? He's the healthiest egotist because he's taken that ego of what he is and then, and then like Jesus demonstrated, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father's heart, right? I, apart from him, I can do nothing. I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear my Father saying. Do you see the balance there? Hmm? You should be the same way as a new creation, not an egotistical person. I am. But once you know that I am joined to the Lord, one spirit with Him, the new creation, me. I am free from the law of sin and death. Sin and death is trying to get me out of that union and operate independent of Him. Does that make sense? He's trying to get me out of that union, that new creation, me, the real me, 
I am joined to the Lord. I am a new creation. An old man died, a new man. I am that new man in Christ. The enemy wants to get me out of that new man and operate independent of God. Jesus, I only do what I see my Father doing. It's not I that do the works, but the Father doing the works through me. He gave us an illustration. There's a healthy ego that I am what I am by the grace of God and I like me. How many Christians can say that even without feeling goofy down here? That's a healthy statement. I am what I am by the grace of God, by the power of regeneration. I like me. It's not me, myself, and I. It's out of the union and communion, my identity. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. This life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And I like the faith of the Son of God. Because it's, He's the believer living in me. You people that are struggling with, i got to have more faith. The reason I didn't have that, I've heard that for 40 years. I am sick of that. I didn't have enough faith. I didn't have enough faith. It isn't about your faith. It's the believer in you, it's the faith of God in you leaning upon Him. See, you think faith is a thing, life is a thing, love is a thing, and that's where the downfall is. It's not a thing, it's the person. God is love, God is light, I am the light of the world, God is light, God is life. It's not a thing. This is eternal life, that they would know me. You search the scriptures in them, you think you have eternal life, yet they point to me and you won't come to me. You want to know about me. You want to be, you want to be scholars of the scripture, but you don't come to me. God's waiting for mothers and fathers to grow into the place of being under the order of Melchizedek. That was a rebuke in the book of Hebrews, whether you know it or not, to the Hebrews. By reason of time, you ought to be teachers. And I'm saying God's coming to the church now and basically saying it's time to grow up. For by reason of time you should have been teachers. And you, you need again the milk of the word. Because we need to graduate. We need to start moving up. We need to start moving from, from me, myself, and I to we. And it is no longer I that live. And then we need to move to where it is others. And God gave me that, and I'm going to close with this, and I'm not going to cover all the stuff on temptation. I think I already nailed you too hard this morning. Save the crown of thorns for next week. <laughs> but when God, when I said, God, show me relationally how to pursue that, he did. It's going to be in our next book, right? He says, Dennis, you can stop at any point. Now you check yourself, see where you stopped. I've shared this before and I'm going to keep sharing it until you see the progression of intimacy with God. Number one, a touch from God. You can go conference to conference, you can go place to place looking for a touch. And you can stop there. And you can do it your whole Christian life. And I've watched people do it. This is not a new thing. God says, in intimacy with me, if you're touching me, once you touch me, you never want to let go. I'm going to find you and I'm going to hold on to you and that touch is going to go to an embrace. Some quit at touch and live the rest of their Christian life in their head doing nice stuff, looking for a touch. But once you've touched and it's brought into an embrace, that embrace then leads you relationally to the next step. And that's a supernatural, spiritual experience of satisfaction. And I can't explain it to you if you never find it. How do you explain satisfaction? I saw it in the, in the priesthood in the sons of Zadok. I saw it in Abraham's life where he says, God is your exceedingly great reward. There is an internal satisfaction that if I've got him, everything else is nice but I've got him, and there's a satisfaction in that. And once you find that satisfaction, it does something else, and it points to where the church needs to be going next. From that place of satisfaction, it points to abounding, overflowing love. The cups that run over. But your cup isn't gonna run over until you clean the cup. God's cleansing the cup before your cup can run it over. But he's looking for abounding love. Satisfaction points to abounding love, but you could stop there. You could stop anywhere you want. You could stop at touch. You could stop at embrace. You could stop at abounding love. But he says, abounding love, that overflow, 
is going to point you to the heart of the Father. That's where the church needs to go. First, the cup's got to get clean. Then the overflow of, an overflow, by the way, is for other people, not for you. My cup runneth over. As I'm overflowing and I'm beginning to be transformed, I'm progressively moving toward the heart of the Father. Then if all of a sudden that takes and there's a revelation of the Father's heart, what does the Father's heart do? He draws sons unto glory. Is that the eternal purpose of God? To bring many sons? He went from the firstborn, I mean the only begotten, to the firstborn amongst many. There's the macro as well as the micro. But God basically said that abounding love is going to point to the heart of the Father. And then it's, that intimacy increases from the heart of the Father. Your passion is going to be others and to bring sons and daughters unto glory. A kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. Kings and priests. A kingdom. A special peculiar possession. A treasure. It's corporate. It's a company. It's not for one person. It's for a larger expression. A company of mature kings and priests sold out to the purposes of God to where I only do what I see my father doing, this is where the greater works are going to come. And the greater works are going to be in stark contrast to the ones who say, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? He's going to say, depart from me for I knew you not. You who work lawlessness, you function lawlessly, you function independently of me and the gifts and the callings were without repentance. And you just stayed there because it made you feel secure in your thing. So think about it, really. Kings and priests unto God. A kingdom of kings and priests. Priests are sold out for the other people. Their inheritance is God himself. Are we preoccupied with other things? If this seems too impossible, what are we doing wrong? If this message feels too hard, what are we doing wrong? We're thinking we have to do it. We're not relying on the fact that there's a greater depth of surrender to him who worketh in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Lord, have your pleasure today. Father, we just pray right now for a deeper, richer surrender in the days ahead. To realize that the cup, the cup has to be clean for it to overflow. I want my cup to overflow. But I want you to cleanse the cup. I want you to shine the light brighter so that I see the things of self that need to be relinquished, to see the things of self that need to be cleaned up, to see attitudes that need to go. And so, Father, I want to walk with those uh, and, and awareness of those, uh, those six C's of flesh that are completely broken out of my life to where there is nothing but a sense of honoring you moment by moment, step by step in the days ahead. For God, you've called, it's your purpose. I didn't pick it out, but God, it was your eternal purpose to bring many sons to glory. But I can't bring them any farther than I am myself. Therefore, I radically surrender to a deeper level than I've ever known before. And do it in me. Revi let revival begin in me first. God, I'm not expecting someone else to do it and then jump on the bandwagon. So start with me. Cleanse my cup. Wash me. Cleanse me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. And God, give me that new spirit. And God, put within my, my innermost being the passionate heart of the Father for his children. That I could say, arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is upon you. And I see your sons and your daughters are coming from afar. And God's going to draw people who want to grow up, who no longer want to be dependent, who no longer want to be uh, uh, victims of the enemy's uh, tactics. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.